So we ended last week with a little, um, a little introduction about the difference between an asset and a liability, just for kind of a recap. Um, and we talked about the need to invest to grow our money with cur the current financial system. And now we get to talk about investing. Hey, Pastor Bob, you know things. How do, can we turn the fans off? Yeah, you know things. Do you know how to turn the fans off? <laughs> None of us know how to turn the fans off. <laughs> so yes, you know things. <laughs> so now we get to talk about investing. So that's kind of exciting. We kind of ended there. So um, before we jump in, I wanted I want to apologize. In my going back and forth to the whiteboard, I completely missed a section last week when we were talking about money management. So if it's okay, I'm going to jump into that real quick, and then we'll kind of get started with this week's lesson. Yeah, <laughs> we didn't have time for it, so I'm going to have to refine that that week to fit it in. But um, we talked, so this would have fit at the end of our budgeting section when we we're talking through our percentages and what should go where. There's cookies, Pastor Bob, and they're really good. So. Banana. Yeah, banana. So. Yeah, Anna better get one too. No, no, that's fine. So, you missed the jokes though. But, so. so we we finished it. We talked about the percentages and kind of we found out I couldn't do math. I'll, I'll fix that. So my my I had the American budget, Pastor Bob. My my budgeting numbers came out to 105 percent. So. I had a, a little math error there. <laughs> yeah, I work for the CDC. I, I fudge numbers a little bit. So. But, or Congress, yeah. yeah. So what I missed there is we had, talked, we had mentioned previously and kind of in that section, we just touched a little bit on like credit card debt. So what I missed was if you find yourself in credit card debt or are in credit card debt, don't beat yourself up. But there's some steps to take. So in week two, we had talked about a bunch of steps for if you make a mistake from Chris Valentin's book. So we could walk through those, and we need to remember if we find ourselves in a bad place from financial decisions, that there's forgiveness, and also that God loves to come alongside us and help us with the messes we've made. And that applies to finances or lots of areas of life. God wants to help us fix where our life is at. He doesn't want to condemn us. So he doesn't want us to stay where we're at. He wants to help us come up higher. Um, so some ways to fix a bad financial decision or being in a bad financial place, uh, ask God for wisdom. Because he tells us if, if we ask for wisdom, he's faithful to give it. Um, set, a diligent, um, set and be diligent about your budget. That's important because we can't keep racking up the credit card debt. So we've got to set and be diligent, diligent about a budget. And then... Uh, this is kind of one, one idea that's made a big difference in many areas of our life that would apply to um, this financial situation with credit cards. Um, so I want to take a quick look at King David, because he had credit cards back then. No, just kidding. <laughs> uh, so in 2 Samuel chapter 11, you guys know the story of David and Bathsheba, when David's on the roof and he sees this babe bathing on a roof farther away from him, and he calls for her, and then sleeps with her, and then comes up with this scheme to try to cover, she gets pregnant, comes up with this scheme to try to cover it up, and gets her husband killed through his scheme. We, we all know that, and we know the sin, but there's a real key in there that I wanted to look at, um, and it is in verse, hmm, verse, it's missing. So it's chapter 11, it's, it's verse 1, haha, <laughs> that's why. So in the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the, king's, with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. So in the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men. So where should David have been? Before all of this started with the sin with Bathsheba, and all the mistakes he made afterwards, was he in the place he should have been? No. He should have been out at war. 
And I think that's, that's key to many areas. If we really look at, in general, if we're struggling in a sin area, sometimes we could be in the wrong place. We could either have the wrong habits in our life, or we could have, um, and that could apply to a lot of things, we could have the wrong friends, you know, in some sins situation. So with this one, if a credit card is a struggle, it's probably time to not have the credit card. Rather than talking about all these, you know, like David, okay, yes, he should have, there's never an excuse for sin. He should not have slept with Bathsheba. He should not have, should not have killed her husband. But he probably could have fixed all of it much easier if he had just gone to war. So the same would apply to credit cards. Um, if, if we do find ourselves in a spending habit where we can't control our spending through the credit card, it's probably time to cut up the credit card and change the environment. So then we can see breakthrough. And then it'll stop all the, the pulling it out of your wallet and swiping it. Um, Dave Ramsey has a really good point about this. He's, he says if you have a credit card spending problem, cut up the credit card. He's big on that. But he, he raises a really good point that anger can be the motivation for good change. So if we find ourselves with credit card debt, it actually is a good thing to be angry that we've made bad decisions, that we have a credit card debt, that we have, or maybe we bought a toy, went and financed a couch, which I don't recommend. But maybe we've done that and find ourselves with debts on things that we wish we hadn't. Um, anger, I, someone pointed this out to me, anger has been actually the root of some of the greatest social change in our country, like the civil rights movement, was people got angry that things weren't the way they should be. And then the whole civil rights movement through peace, peaceful protest, which is lost today. But anger can be the start of something that Anger can be something we need to harness to make some changes that can be hard. So that kind of sums up what I missed last week. So, But I wanted to make sure to hit that. So we're going to jump into investing now, which is a really exciting topic for me. I was telling Carissa that this is probably my, I, I'm most excited about this week. So this is fun stuff for me. So um, feel free to Stop me if I'm going too fast and you have questions or if a term doesn't make sense or anything, feel free to stop me. Um, I'm going to try to do, we noticed when Chris and I were watching back a video, when you guys ask questions, you can't hear it on the recording. So I'm going to try to repeat the questions a little bit more. And then uh, Brandon also aimed some microphones at you guys to try to pick up a little bit. So I'm going to try to adjust for that a little bit so that way anyone that watches the recording can... Um, can hear the question and then the discussion that follows. So, um, but jumping into uh, investing, the first thing I wanted to talk about is risk management. Because there's always risk when it comes to investing. So there's some factors we need to consider um, when it comes to risk and our investing. Um, so a few of these factors to consider are our age. Younger people, especially coming out of high school and in their 20s, have time on their side. So they can make riskier investments because if something does go wrong with that investment and they lose a bunch of money, they do have time on their side to make up for that and to have investments with, that will then flourish. Um, the older we get or the clo closer to retirement, we need to start thinking about having safer investments that don't have the risk of, of a huge loss. So when we're talking about risk management, um, age is one thing to consider. Um, your comfort level is a big one. So investing and loss can be really hard because investing will come with some failures and some setbacks and we'll probably lose some money. So you need to figure out um, kind of where your comfort level is. I've traded some uh, stock options trading strategies that were very, very risky, and they worked really, really well for a while, and then I lost a whole bunch of money. So the one, the one system, it was going really well. I was up like 300%, and then in the matter of like two trades, I had lost that whole 300% profit and then also lost 140%. So yeah, so there's some really high risk options trading strategies that you need to figure out your comfort level with. I figured out after that one, I'm not comfortable with that. <laughs> with that risky of a system that I can basically have a 400% turnaround in, in a matter of like two trades. 
So I, I stopped that system. But that's an example that there can be some really risky ones. There's ways to structure and do things in a safe manner. Um, when we get into talking about stocks, we can talk a little bit that, about that. But if you do start trading individual stocks, you can actually digitally set like stop losses. So if your stock does go down a certain percentage, it will automatically sell for you. So there are a lot of things, a lot of tools available and a lot of strategies to manage risk through different kind of investments. But we need to figure out our comfort level and then pick a strategy that's gonna fit well with that comfort level for, um, for risk management. And then your financial situation is another factor that, that plays into risk management. If you've just saved a whole bunch of money, like we were back in the budgeting, and you save money, you're, you've got a, a chunk saved up that you wanna invest in something, you probably don't want to put it all in that option system that I traded. After a year of saving or whatever time frame of, sa of saving, um, I, I did it with a very small chunk of money when I tried that options trading system. So I was very careful. I used a little bit of extra profits I'd made from other systems to try that one, and it didn't go that well. But So we need to uh, think about our financial situation. If we're putting a chunk of money that we just spent a year saving, we probably do want to try to manage risk um, the best that we can. And we will talk about, as we get into different ways of investing, we'll get into kind of how to manage risk in that investment a little bit. Um, but what, what I believe to be the single best way to manage risk is education. The more you know and understand about a specific way that you are going to invest, the less, the less risk there will be. Um, so when you pick a strategy or you pick, say you want to invest in real estate or you do decide you want to invest in stocks or maybe you want to invest in gold, the more you can learn about that investment, that form of investing, the less risk there's going to be. So education is, is huge. So I, I enjoy this, so I, I still read a lot of books. And I have a, an uncle that trades stocks, and we talk probably weekly about different strategies and how we can learn from mistakes we've made. And the more I learn, the better I'm doing with trading, so, and the less I'm losing, <laughs> which, which would be a good goal in investing. Don't lose money. So, um, so education is, is really important. Um, I've got... A book, actually I realized I left one other book at home, so. But uh, cash flow, I left at home. I was gonna show you a couple books I recommend, but I only have one, so sorry. At least a couple of you took pictures. Maybe you could forward the picture of cash flow to those that want it at the end. Um, and then when it comes to investing, Robert Kiyosaki talks about, you'll see I go back to Robert Kiyosaki a lot. He's one of my favorites, but he talks about an idea that there needs to be a mindset shift um, when we when we start investing, when we st when we grow up in school, we learn a system of education that when you fail, it stops you from moving forward. Right? If you fail a test, you got to either make up work or hope you can do really good on other work to still pass the class. If you fail a class, you got to retake the class. Um, so a failure in our educational system stops you from advancing. But in investing. Failure can be one of your greatest teachers. So failure is an opportunity to learn. So we do need to, and it's going to come with investing, as I've learned. So we need to have a slight mindset shift that failure does, isn't keeping you back from advancing. It can be that tool that's helping you learn to be more successful in the future. So we're going to talk about um, two ways to invest, because when you... When you're looking for investment advice, it's important to research the person that is giving that advice. So I only want to talk to you about two areas that I feel comfortable enough with my knowledge to talk to you about. Um, some, area, some ways to invest, not all of these that I can talk about because I'm not experienced enough in them. Um, so their ways to invest would be real estate, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, gold or silver, uh, there's Forex, the Forex market, which is trading world currencies. And I don't understand that. It's very complicated, and I don't understand it. Some people, I believe, make a lot of money doing it that understand it, but I don't. But Forex trading uh, currencies can be a way to invest. Uh, if you're going to consider Forex, spend a lot of time learning. 
So I, I know someone that spent two years trying to learn Forex, and I'm not sure if they're successful yet, but they're, they're really putting the time into trying to learn the system. That, one's the, that is one that is way too complicated for me. So unless you like complexity of trying to figure out how to trade one country's economy versus another country's economy, and all the factors that would go into that, I wouldn't recommend Forex unless you really, really like that complicated stuff. Hey Scott, yeah. Yeah. It's it's very risky and it's very very complicated. I had an uncle that wanted to trade Forex for a while, and I think on the first, I don't know how many trades, he made a ton of money, and then it went bad really fast. So I mean. There, if you can do it well, there is a lot of money to be made in Forex. But it's, it's so complicated, I don't even understand how to start trading Forex well. I mean, it's just that complicated, to me anyway. I just, you're, you're picking, in Forex, you're picking pairs. That you're trading how one currency is, I believe, this is my understanding, you're trading how one world currency uh, does against another currency. And you have to pick that pairing of currencies. And then, I don't know, it's just... It's beyond me, so it's in here as my list of ways to invest, but please know there's a lot of cautions as I list that. So, and then cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies is, did you have a question? Okay. Cryptocurrencies is an... <laughs> Chicken. <laughs> yeah. Crypto, you can ask at the end. Okay. We will get in, I want to talk about that a little bit when we tar start talking about stock options. Because stock options to me, I don't know, it gets borderline of what would be considered gambling. I don't consider it gambling personally, but I would say it is pushing a gray area that my wife considers stock options trading gambling. So we kind of go back and forth on that one. But um, we are going to talk about stock investing tonight. So I will kind of mention options. I don't... I have not found a successful options trading strategy myself, so I'm not going to give you recommendations on how to trade stock options, <laughs> but because I have not found one that I'm successful with um, that I would feel comfortable telling you to try. <laughs> but um, So with that being said, we're going to talk about two areas of investing that I do feel comfortable talking to you about, um, one being stocks and stock trading and the second one being real estate. So I wanted to tell you just, when you're taking advice in investing, it's important to know who you're taking advice from and where they're at in their journey in this investing. So I wanna be, I wanna be kinda upfront with you where I am at so you know what level you should put that advice in your mind. So um, when it comes to stocks, I've been uh, actively trading stocks myself for um, six years now. Um, my uncle got me started, and I used to have mutual funds, and I sold all my mutual funds six years ago and started buying individual stocks and trading different strategies myself six years ago. Um, I've had some ups and downs, but over the course of the six years, I have made about 40%. So it's not tremendous. I mean, I, I do think I'm beating... Like they say the stock market on average goes up about seven to eight percent is kind of the average curve that the market goes up. So I was able to, if you average it out over the course of time I've been trading, keep up with the market or maybe beat it just a little bit. So um, I have, I found a few things that work in that area, but I do want you to take the advice as what it is. I've been trading for six years. That's kind of my success rate. So there are people that are more successful than I am that can probably give better advice. So. Um, that's that's kind of where I'm at in my stock trading. And then real estate, um, mom and dad purchased their first rental when I was 14. So I've been around real estate for almost 20 years now and investing in rental properties uh, and fixing them and maintaining them and buying and selling. Um, we currently, we actually just bought two more eight plexes uh, a week and a half ago. So we're now up to 115 units that, uh, that we manage and maintain. And 
So that's uh, my, my real estate investing has been a little more extensive than my stock. So I do feel more comfortable talking through real estate strategies than I do with stock strategies. So just so you know, um, kind of my background, that's where I'm coming from. Uh, all our properties are in Rice Lake and Cameron. We've stuck to this local area, so we, we like it here. So, um, but that's kind of my background, and I don't tell you that to brag or anything, but I, I do want you to, when you take advice from someone on investments, it's important to know where they're at, and if you don't want to be where they're at, don't take their advice. Because you'll get a stock tip from, you know, Buddy Joe on the street sometimes. You know, you want to know who you're taking the advice from. So I just want you to know where I'm at so you can weigh the advice accordingly. Um, so choosing what investing is right for you. And I've been learning a lot in this area over the last year. And uh, it has actually helped my investing, I believe. Um, we'll see long term. But one of the, the biggest things I'm learning is in investing is, like we talked about earlier, to manage risk and to do it well. It takes education. It takes learning about it, which takes time. So if you enjoy something, if you enjoy an investing strategy, it's going to help you a lot because it takes some time to get good at it. So I would really encourage you to, I have done this a lot, to try to find what I enjoy, especially when it comes to stock trading, because it just, it does take time. So if you enjoy the time you're putting into it, it makes it a whole lot more fun. And what I've been finding in my own life is it makes it more successful when, I, when I'm enjoying the way I'm, the strategy I'm trying to implement, implement, then I'm enjoying learning about it. I'm in, even when I fail, because I'm enjoying it, you know, it helps that failure not seem so hard to take. It's a, it's easier to take it as a learning opportunity. Um, there are a lot of ways to invest. So I believe most people can find a way to invest that has some interest to them. Um, I was listening to Dave Ramsey and he was, he was talking about a millionaire that he interviewed, because he goes around, he's up in the thousands of millionaires that he's interviewed now to learn different things they've done and try to put together some ideas of what he can see as common threads between all these millionaires. So one millionaire he uh, was interviewing had a net worth of about $200 million. And Dave Ramsey started asking questions. How did you get to have this net worth? Did you, do you trade stocks? And he's like, no, I don't trade stocks. He's like, do you buy gold and silver? No, I don't buy gold and silver. He's like, do you buy mutual funds? No, I don't, I don't do anything. that. I don't know anything about that. And he's like, well, what do you do? The guy was a farmer and a rancher. So he bought farmland and ranch land and had a net worth of $200 million. So he knew farming. He liked farming and ranching. He was interested in farming and ranching. And he just kept pursuing that. And he found a way to obviously be successful investing in farm and ranch land. I don't know how to do that, but he had a net worth of 200 million, so he was successful. He found something, I guess what, what that taught me is if you're interested in something and you pursue it, it likely can grow into an investing opportunity. So, um, so it, it is important to have interest in the way that you, you plan to invest. And if, if you don't find something that interests you, keep looking. So, um, but real estate, we're going to jump in because part of looking is learning about what it, what an investment looks like in that, what a strategy is, and then if it sparks interest in you, great. If not, start learning about a, a next or next way to invest. Um, so I want to talk to you about real estate. This this one's exciting to me. Um, so the primary goal of investing. I'm going to talk about one specific area of real estate investing, and that would be income generating, in, income producing properties. Um, you can invest in land with the, the goal of growing it. I, I haven't done that. I don't have experience in that. This guy had done farmland and did well. But I, I want to talk to you about uh, rental properties, income producing real estate investments. Um, so what is the primary goal of income producing real estate investments? It's going to sound a little redundant, but the primary goal is monthly cash flow. That's one of the main things you're looking, or if you want to look at it annually, I just like monthly. It's easier numbers to understand. But the goal is monthly cash flow. And cash flow, simply put, is money left over after all expenses have been paid. So your repairs, any mortgage taxes, your cash flow is the money left over after all that is paid. 
I think the easiest way for me to show you this is to go through a hypothetical scenario. Is that okay? We're just going to jump right in. I think the easiest way is for me to just, just start going through something with you guys. And this would have been nice. I didn't have time to print my notes, and I've always wanted to try. It seems more efficient to, to speak from a, a computer or an iPad. So I wanted to try this, so I'm just going to have to kind of move everything with me as we go. Um, so one of the easiest ways to, one of the ways that just about everybody that starts investing in, in, in rental properties is to buy a duplex. So I'm just going to be simple and we're just going to go twoplex. I hope that's okay. I'll abbreviate. So the way you would analyze buying an income property is obviously you would have to look at your purchase price. So for this example, let's just say prices are kind of wild right now. Anna knows the real estate market. But we're going to pick round numbers. So I don't think you can find this property out on the market because I rounded everything off a lot just to make it easy. But let's for, for our scenario, let's say you have a purchase price for a duplex of $100,000. And you are able, you saved to be able to invest in a, in a property and you have a down payment, down payment of 20%. We'll just do this. We're just kind of walking through this. And then as you have, once we get through this, I want to kind of open up for questions. Because this was the best way I could figure to just kind of dive right in. So you put $20,000 down, which would leave you um, going to a bank and getting a mortgage of $80,000. Okay, we tracking so far? So purchase price, down payment, then equals what you would have on a mortgage. So after you figure that out, then you can start figuring out real numbers. So I always look at, you want to look at two categories. You want to look at the income, and then we're going to go over there for expenses. So your income on a duplex would be the rent you get from the two units. So for our scenario, let's say unit, unit one, gets $650 a month. I don't know why I put a comma in there. 650 and unit two gets 550 a month. That would be rents kind of in line with what we see for like our up-down duplexes in the area. You know, if they're in nice condition, two bedrooms, these would be kind of typical rents we would see. Um, rounded, rounded off a little bit. Mom likes... She thinks people, she's like the Walmart. She thinks people like the number games. So she'll do, instead of doing 700, she'll do 695. And so, I don't <laughs> She's done it for years. We get good tenants. It works. So I'm not going to argue with the system because it's, it's worked. So, um, so, but I don't want to do that in our math. That makes it too complicated. So that would, the, that would make a total income of $1,200 a month. Since we know I have math problems, feel free to double check. <laughs> I don't want to end up with 105% budget <laughs> this time around. <laughs> so our income would be $1,200 a month. That would be our gross rent. And then we move on to the expenses category. I think I got enough room here. So expenses, we need to include anything that would take money out of our pocket. So we're going to start with the big ones. So the mortgage payment would be, so right now, um, current interest rates, uh, rental properties are considered commercial when you go to a bank. So a commercial property, you can only go a maximum of 20 years on the loan, and interest rates are typically 1%, roughly 1% higher than what you could get like for your regular home loan. So interest rates right now on commercial are 4.5%. Uh, amortized for 20 years, which would make the payment $506 a month on the $80,000 loan. Uh, and then taxes, you know, since we have our lovely property taxes once you're a property owner. So taxes, um, I just picked a round number. Duplexes we have are somewhere in the $1,800, $2,000 $1,600 ballpark. So I just picked $1,800, which 1,800 divided by 12 would be $150 a month for the real estate property taxes. 
you need to insure your building. So you'd have insurance. Um, I looked up what we have, what our insurance is costing us on some, a few of our duplexes, and it's costing about $650 a year to insure a duplex that would be in this range. Um, so that would make the monthly payments for insurance $54 a month. And then other things. We, initially starting out, we would buy, sometimes buy duplexes where we paid the heat and we paid the electricity and we paid the water. And we quickly learned that those ones don't necessarily make a lot of money because your tenants, when it's 20 below out and they feel like having it 80 degrees, they're not paying the heat, so they'll just turn it up to 80. So we, in general, I think we only own one duplex left where we pay heat. So we've kind of cleaned that area up. So unless it's really good, I would recommend finding something that has the utilities split so that the tenants are paying all their own utilities, their own electricity, water, and heat. They seem to work much better. So I, in this scenario, we're not going to include any utility cost. But if you did have one where you happen to pay heat or maybe as an older house that converted to a duplex, you paid all the water in the building still. You would need to include your utility cost. And then um, repairs. There's some, there's some percentages that are common for figuring in your repair and maintenance, um, figuring putting some money away for long-term repairs, like when you need a new roof or you need new windows and you need a furnace, and vacancy. Those are all things you need to include as you're analyzing. Um, and a typical number for all of those is 5% of your gross monthly rent. So we would put um, what that would look like in this scenario would be repairs. 5% of the gross, gross monthly rent would be $60. So we'd have 60 for repairs, um, saving for, I'll just call it big repairs for simplicity here. So saving for your big repairs, your capital improvements like the roof and the furnace would also be $60 at 5% of gross monthly rent. And um, vacancy. Mom is very good at filling our apartments. So she once had a banker sit down. Um, I, I say this, you can, you can tighten up this area if you work hard. She had a banker sit down with her. He's like, you do really good with rent. I want to figure out your, your actual vacancy rate. And I think it came out to one and a half percent. So mom, but mom is really on top of it. I mean, she, when she finds, she's advertising right away, she's showing all the time, she's coordinating when people are moving. Uh, a typical number is to figure that 5%, but if you want to put the work in, you can shrink that. So, but for our scenario of vacancy, 5%, another $60. Which, as long as I can punch numbers in a calculator correctly, I didn't do this in my head, it's, that would be $890 a month of expenses. We tracking, we doing good so far? So then to analyze the cash flow, you take your, so cash flow, I'll just do CF for cash flow. You take your income, and you subtract your expenses, and that will give you the cash flow. So we have income of $1,200 a month, expenses of $890 a month. And I'm just going to look over here rather than try to do it in my head, which would give us a monthly cash flow of $310 a month. And that's after paying, putting money aside for repairs, for vacancy, for your big improvements. So that's, you know, you're, that's after you're actually even planning ahead so that's a, that's a nice conservative way to figure out uh, the cash flow of an income property. Let's see if I got any other notes here. Oh, I do. So when I look at an income producing property, I like to see, you know, however many units you have. On the, low, the lowest side of something that I would even consider investing in, I like to see $100 a month cash flow per unit. So like in this case, you've got two units. So when you divide it, divide your this cash flow number here, this monthly cash flow by the number of units of the property, the lowest side I look at, and it's not ideal, but I would still consider it depending on the condition of the property and the location and such, would, would be $100 a month. Um, I'd like to see closer to 150 is when I consider it being something that, that I'm much more pleased with. 
Um, more is obviously better. So, But that's kind of like a couple ranges there. That's kind of what I like to see. Like if it's down making $60 a month, I just keep going. You know, It's just not, I don't think that's, to, in my mind, that's just not enough per unit. You'll get your... You'll get in trouble once it comes to your bigger repairs at some point when, with that kind of low low margins. So are there any questions on that? I kind of just flew through how to analyze the income of a rental property. Did I go through that clearly enough? Are we... I'm yeah. thinking, when you go to sell the property... Yes. typically increase in value. So, uh, and we're going to talk about property value in just a little bit. So, um, but most of, in general, one of the rules with real estate and pretty much any purchase is your purchase price, you can't overpay when you buy it. But if you're buying a, a property at a good value, uh, we've seen them go up over the years. Definitely go up. So, uh, even we purchased a or the 2008 housing crash. So everything, we bought it, it went down like 30% in 2008 because that was not a good time for real estate. But it has, it's now it's even worth more than, than prior to 2008. So if you look at a bigger picture, it has gone up. You didn't want to buy in 06 and sell in 08 or 09. That, was, that would not have seen a, an increase. Yeah. Yeah, your roof, your furnace, if you've got to do siding at some point down the road. So you're planning to put that, just put that in a savings account? Yeah, yeah, you want to start setting that aside in like a savings account. And that's, that's pretty much it. It, it seems, that's the number in a lot of books. We, we even went down, um, we did a coaching session with Peter's Rentals down in Eau Claire. They've got, they advertise on WWIB, so that's how we heard about them, and they say they got rentals in Eau Claire, Menominee, and Strum, and I'm like, well, that's three cities, and they're advertising on the radio. <laughs> they must be doing pretty good. So we went down, and they do have a lot of units, and they, they even recommended that 5% um, for, for your capital improvements. You know, you got to repave the parking lot or something, but it... It does, I don't, every, lots of books I've read in Peter's, it just seems to be the number that everyone lands on. And that may, you know, it may hurt because you may buy your property and in three years you've got to do a roof, but you're going to be paying that back then through that 5%. Does that make sense? So over the a longer term of owning your property, because when you, you know, you buy it, you start putting 5% a month away and then you've got to do a roof three years after purchase, you haven't saved that money yet. But you've got to look at over the course of 10 years, you're still putting that 5% away, away when you have a good roof on the building now. Yeah. Yeah, you increased your property value by maintenance. So, so it, it, it is something that 5% does need to be looked at if you know, you're owning the property over a little longer term that should cover your, big, your bigger expenses. So It does hurt a little bit when you buy that duplex and your furnace goes out two years after, and you haven't been able to really put the money away yet, so then you end up paying it back, but it does, over the long run, the 5% does seem to work out for those big, you know, saving for your roofs and your, your other stuff. So, those are good questions. Any, I should, so the, the first question, since I was trying to repeat these, <laughs> the first question was, does property value go up over time? I guess would be the quick way to summarize that. And then the second question, was, is 5% enough putting away for the big repairs? So I'll try to do, for those that are watching this later, I'll try to do better at repeating them right away. So, yes? So what amount would you pay taxes on cash flow-wise? Cash flow-wise, taxes is a good question. So, so your business, would your business be paying taxes on the 310, or would it some of the 5%? This is, this is a really fun part about real estate. So, I am, and I'm not going to claim to be a tax expert. We hire a really good accountant for that. So, we actually go down to Eau Claire for accounting because we researched and we found a good one down there. Um, but taxes, 
So you're making $300 a month. Um, there's two aspects that are important. Uh, the question, to repeat it, is um, what would you pay taxes on? Or are you paying taxes on the $310 a month? Or what does the tax look like on this income property? Is that a fair summary? Um, a wonderful thing, there's, there's two aspects I want to talk about this. Uh, passive, this would be considered passive income on your taxes. And passive income is the lowest taxed income category. So it's lower than earned income, it's lower than capital gains income. Passive income is your lowest taxed. I believe passive income typically comes out at a tax rate of like 13%. If I'm, if I'm getting my numbers right, I'm pulling this off the top of my head, but I do know for sure that passive income is your lowest taxed income. So that's one aspect. And then the second aspect, which is a really nice loophole about investing in real estate properties. Um, the government and the IRS, I don't know when they decided this, but at some point they decided that a rental property owner is allowed to write off the value of the, the building over the course of 28 years, and they call that depreciation. And that goes on your taxes as an expense, even though you don't actually spend any money on it. So you would depreciate your full price of $100,000 over 28 years. Um, I don't know. It wouldn't make a difference if you paid that 100000 in cash? No, no. Well, you get to, it doesn't make a difference if you pay 100% cash or if it's on a 100% loan. You get to write off the full price, the purchase price of your rental property over 28 years. So with this 300, yes, I, I'm pretty sure it's 28 years. I, I probably should have looked that up, but it's, it's really close to that. That's, so this property would show a loss on your taxes. So it actually go to reduce your income. Even though you are getting this money put in your pocket, it's, it's a nice loophole that the government gives you. You get to write off that full price over 28 years. So did you so. divide that up by 28? I, I haven't looked. The, the tax accountant... No, no. It would, I believe it's just it's a 128th per year. But I'm, I'm not positive because there is a... You will set, when you buy a property, you set a depreciation schedule. And I, I do think you have an option to weight that more heavily at, for more write-offs at the start when income's lower. I think you have some options with that when it comes to the accountant. We, we just trust our accountant to set our depreciation schedule at what's wise for our business. So I haven't, I haven't spent a lot of time learning about the depreciation schedule. I think there's some options you can do there, but I would have to look into that. Yeah, it, that, that is what determines what you pay in capital gains. So the amount you have taken in depreciation over whatever course between when you bought it and you sell it is used to calculate what you're going to pay in capital gains tax. Yeah, yeah, it reduces your basis. So that's a, when it comes to a sale, your depreciation, they're going to get their money in their capital gains tax. I haven't looked into that yet yeah, about when it's passed on. Interesting. So the question, the question. It's like the only way to get around that. Yeah. There, take in the depreciation. Yeah, there's, there's some ways to get around that. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, even, even other than an accountant, and we have used this technique. So the last question was, um, or the last comment was about passing real estate on to, uh, heirs. to your heirs. Um, and the comment on that was that uh, Dan, who took a, who is a real estate agent, remembers that uh, they say that the the depreciation resets then for the heirs once it's passed on. So 
I need to look into that, but I, that sounds right. So one way, if you do choose to sell a property, this, we're getting into some, some real estate loopholes here and tactics. Uh, this one is, it's, these are all, I'm not going to talk about anything that's questionable tax law-wise. So when I say a loophole, I'm meaning that it's fully legal in our tax law. Because I don't want to give you advice to do anything illegal. But um, there is, if, if you want to keep, if you want to keep growing, yeah, I might not be allowed to teach this course again if I was <laughs> giving that kind of advice. But if, so say you're, you're growing a real estate business. This is what we've done over the years. And you have one, one way that you'll find you end up doing it is you have to sell a property to get this down payment for bigger property. And when you do that, you're allowed to do what's called a, uh, the tax code number is 1031. So it's commonly become called a 1031 exchange. And what that allows you to do is it allows you to defer your taxes. So you sell, you are allowed to purchase a property of equal or greater value, and you don't pay any capital gains tax at that time. And you're allowed to roll your entire profit from your sale to the purchase of the new property without paying any taxes. Now the basis, like Dan was talking about, where you're at in your depreciation schedule from property, the initial property, is will be carried over to the new property. So when you sell that one, you will pay capital gains tax on both. But in, in real estate investing, you're trying to move these smaller properties into something you're going to hold long term. So that deferment can be quite lengthy. I mean, it's there. You're not cheating the government long run out of any taxes. They're going to get their capital gains tax in the end. But it allows you not to pay it until you want to pay it because you're choosing when to sell that next property. So this, I, I didn't think we were going to get this into depth, but this is good. So there's, there's all kinds of cool stuff once it comes to real estate that you can do. So um, that's, that's one we have utilized many times and might be using again here in the near future if everything goes well. But it's really nice to not pay your capital gains to because not only is your property on a regular basis going up in value, your tenants through the income are paying down the mortgage. So your mortgage is coming down, your property value is going up, you're paying down the mortgage. So you can, you know, after five, ten years, you can come out with a really nice profit, which then can be a big down payment on, on a bigger property if, if that's the direction you choose to go. So... Yeah, which then can produce more cash flow. So, um, so that's that's kind of some fun stuff. So, depreciation is. I'm glad that came up. I I'm going to make a note to add that to my notes because that really is a nice thing. We actually had um, a scenario where we wanted to sell a duplex that we had only owned like two years, so we hadn't taken much depreciation on it. So our tax accountant, we we sent him an email and said, you know, we're, we're going to sell this property, we want to purchase a property of this type. Should we do a, a 1031 exchange? And he actually told us not to because of where we were at. We had only owned it a couple of years. So it was better to pay a little bit of capital gains tax at that time because most of our capital gains tax was actually able to be written off through depreciation on other properties and the new property we purchased. So so a good a good accountant can be a, a real benefit too. So but that's that's fun stuff. Uh, that's actually a lot of good information now about some of the benefits and what you're looking for um, with real estate investing. I should give one little caution. Uh, real estate investing does come with dealing with tenants. <laughs> So, unless you want to factor in a management company, and a management company, if you choose to go that route, there's, it's actually quite easy to do. Um, so your management company will take your phone calls, um, can do your showings, uh, can collect rent if you want them to. A typical rate, depending on the services you want, um, is 5% of your monthly rent. Um, yeah, so, it, and that's, but then they, but then they will, that usually does not include your showing time. So that's, they'll, they'll take your phone call of my light bulb's out. Can you send one out to fix it? And, you know, they'll answer all your phones for that. We haven't used a management company, but I believe that that's, 
I know that's the typical rate, and I believe the services it includes would be rent collection and answering the phone. And then if they need to dispatch a repairman, that would be part of that as well. Yeah, you need to find someone that, <laughs> find a management company, There's and they have to be licensed, and but there's there's people out there that do it. So, but you do have to deal with tenants. So you have to either decide, can I handle dealing with the tenants? And if you're interested in investing in real estate and you don't want to handle the tenants, then you do have to factor in what your management fee would be. But, yeah. No. <laughs> the the answer you can't pick you. You can't pick any, you can't tell them any reason you're picking, to my understanding. You, but you have to designate your, if you want to go with seniors, my understanding is you actually have to designate that property for seniors and you have to go get approval with the city. I think it goes through, uh, through the building inspector and then probably approval to the city council. We haven't done that process. But to my knowledge, that is the only legal way to screen by an age. You have to get it designated as a senior apartment. Um, there's one down in Cameron. I think there's a, hand, there's a bunch around town that have done that. But um, you can, you actually are, it's, it's really one, it's really difficult legally right now picking tenants because there's so much you're not allowed, you're not allowed to screen by. And some of it's good stuff that you want to screen by. So, um, it gets it gets tricky, but you know you do the what we do is we do the best we can to be fair to people, and we try to choose the best tenant we can for the reasons we want them, and then we basically just don't tell anybody why we picked them or why we didn't pick them. So we just the phrase we use a lot is we decided to go a different direction for people we don't want, because if you tell them if you start telling them why you didn't select them, a lot of it could fall under discrimination law somewhere. So that's, a, that's an area that if you do start selecting tenants, you just need to be really careful. You can, you can do your selection, just do not tell why you did what you did. <laughs> And that would be something your management, if you do go that route, your management company would be knowledgeable about. So they would be helping you in that area to not get you in discrimination trouble. So. Is there a segment that you prefer to go? We've got people all the way from, what's our youngest? Our youngest would probably be, I know we've rented to 18 year olds before. I'm trying to think what our current youngest would be, probably low 20s. And then we've been rented all the way up through 80s. So I don't, mom has gotten really good at meeting people and, and just reading where they're at. I mean, nice people of any age, age category are gonna be better than a bad person in a certain age category. So we've, had, we've actually had really good luck with young people. I mean, if you find someone that's ambitious, that's trying to make something of their life, that's proud of, you know, being able to have an apartment, they've been really good for us. The only downside is they don't stay as long as maybe someone in an old, older age category. But we've had, we've had great young people, you know, over the years. And even currently, we have, we have one building that we've just figured out there's five young World Harvest people living in one building. So in five different apartments. And they're all doing very, very well. They've been great. They, they're respectful. If we, we try to treat them well. If they need something repaired, we try to get over there right away. So I, we found good people in all age categories. So. And single moms even has been, you know, with divorce rate and where everything's at. But we've had a, a ton of really good single moms with one or two kids. I mean, it's just been, they have a bad breakup. Maybe they've made some bad life choices up to that point. But then they're at a point where they really just want to do what's right for the kids, provide a good home, you know, provide a good life. And we've got some single moms that have just been phenomenal tenants. So it's just, it's just finding out about the person is really the, we don't do a lot. We don't pay for a background check. 
Um, we do check the Wisconsin Circuit Court, which you're not allowed to use in your selection process. <laughs> but we do check it just to see what's on there. <laughs> yeah, so, and I, that's about most of what how mom selects tenants is by, she uses three personal references, and she'll call them. Three personal references and a work reference is what she likes. And that's been, you can, you can tell by the reference if you get them talking. You know, you can learn a lot from a good, a good personal reference. So that's been kind of our selection criteria. Those references have been huge. You, you reject them, you don't have to explain why. No, they might ask you why, and we just don't tell them. <laughs> you don't, you have no, to my knowledge, you have no legal requirement to tell them why you rejected them as a potential tenant. Even when you evict someone, you don't have to tell them why. Yeah, we do everything... Um, if I should, I should clarify that. If you, have a, if you have a year lease, you do have to cite the violation of the lease. We have switched everything to month to month for this reason. So all of our leases are just a 30-day lease. And they, then it's written in the lease, they automatically renew. So if we want to evict someone, all we have to tell them is that the lease is terminated. We don't have to cite, because it's only a 30-day lease. We don't even have to cite part of the lease that they violated. We can just say, we're sorry, but your lease is terminated at whatever date, so. But yeah, and we did learn on the, on the legal side of things, it doesn't, it goes from the start of their lease period to the end of their lease period. We thought it went from the first to first, even if you signed the lease on the 15th. We learned that one, that whatever date you sign the lease, it extends 30 days from that date. So even if they move in in a half a month, we still have them sign on the first, you know. And then we'll usually write a note that they, they moved in at this date prorated at this portion, but the lease terms are from the first to the first. So. We've learned a lot of things over the years. We, we had one tenant that uh, she had a charity help her with her first month, different charities help her with her first month's rent and security deposit and then she never paid us a dime. So, and she was on a month-to-month -month lease, so we gave her a 30-day notice, which she did not move for. So then we had to go file uh, at the Barron County Courthouse to evict, and then they give a certain amount of time. They have the sheriff deliver a notice, and then they show up in a certain amount of time, and she took it all the way to, we had to appear before a judge to get her to move. But that was, she's the only one that fought it that much in 20 years wow. of working with people. How many We've, months evicted? Uh, in, I think in total we lost three or four months of rent. I mean, it, it was a process. And it's, it, that process gets really frustrating when she's not paying and she's yeah. fighting it in the court system and still living in your apartment. Oh. Yeah, we still have bills to pay and she's still living in the property that we own. <laughs> No, you, not in, certainly not not heat in the winter. No, so what's that? Utility companies can't even turn off. No, the the yeah, the utility can't turn off the heat in the winter. So yeah, so and I think that one did start falling into the winter months, and so that was a it's a fun one. So. They did technically we won, but she hasn't. So. Yeah, I mean, the judge gave a judgment that she owed us. We had laid out exactly all the unpaid utilities and the unpaid rent and everything, and we had factored in some cleanup and repair costs, and the judge ordered that we receive all that. And was, so. that was that situation one of those things that you guys told them you should include utilities? We've thought about that. Utilities, you get in Rice Lake and Cameron, they go back on the tax bill. You get stuck with them no matter what. You can't avoid them as a landlord. We don't, we don't like writing out, it's a pain to write that many checks. Is the main reason we don't, some landlords wanna pay all utilities for that reason, and they factor that into the rent, so that way tenants don't get behind on their utilities. But that's a lot of checks to write. You know, we'd be writing 115 checks extra a month for all those utility bills. So at, at our size, we decided that 
we're just going to have the tenants pay. But th on a, a smaller scale, there's a lot of landlords that do that. They, they'll advertise their rent at 650 a month, and then they'll just say that we've prorated the utilities at this, and we collect this much extra for your utilities. You know, so because you can get like your heat, you can get your gas prorated over the year. So you can just show them, you know, here's the proration of the gas per year. So you got to pay this on a monthly basis. Here's the the proration of the electric over a year. You can show them those bills and. Yeah, yeah, you either, it's really convenient for the utility company, and we actually go pay, we go in and pay it right away, because if it goes, does go to the point where it goes on your tax bill, it has the late fees and the interest as well. So we don't go pay, uh, pay it off as quick as possible once it gets switched back to our responsibility, because we don't want to pay that extra 3%. I don't, I don't know legally what you're allowed to do there. So we've never tried to do that. I would imagine there's some legal research that would need to be done there. If, if you're charging them for the heat and then you're taking control of it, I don't know. I, yeah. Yeah. With the proration, um, the utility company will prorate it, like, so say you got a natural gas furnace, they'll prorate it on the previous year's usage, and then um, they just take that over 12 months. They will come and reevaluate if your proration wasn't enough to cover than what your current heating season was. And they'll come back and charge you a little extra. So I think the way I would want to do that is I'd have them pay the proration amount and then say, if, if you do go over this proration amount and we get that bill from the utility company, we're going to be asking you to pay that. So we don't have many that once it's prorated, I mean, the, the company, utility companies are pretty good, and I think they build in a little buffer. So we haven't seen, a lot of our tenants do prorate their heat over the year because they want to pay a set amount. And we don't, we get copies of all the bills, we don't see many proration adjustments at the end of the year. So I don't think that you'd get someone, nobody wants to live at 80 degrees all the time. No. You know what I mean? So, well, I, I guess I shouldn't say nobody. My wife liked it when we were heating with wood and the house was 84. But, <laughs> but most people <laughs> don't want to live at 80 degrees all the time. So, you know, they, they may be really cold and turn it up for a day. <laughs> yeah. So... We haven't, I don't know, you just deal with some of that. So we've, we've preferred to just like write less checks, and, and that's got us downsides, but we don't have to write checks every month, which is nice. So, or set up auto pay, but, you know. Any, any other questions about real estate investing? We're, we're going to cover property value and how to analyze property values, too. Um, but just on this, like, this cash flow side of things. Any other questions? Go ahead and ask them. So, just real quick, how, how often do you leverage one property on the next? I mean, kind of the Trump method. Yep. Do you do that often? We we do that a lot. So, um, we have we've done that a lot, and we've done varying amounts. We've purchased some properties with zero down. So, oh yeah, thank you. Repeat the question. So the question is. Uh, how often and how can you leverage a property um, in the purchase of another property? So we have, uh, we've done it both ways. We have used a 1031 exchange to have a down payment on a property. But then you can also, um, a, a bank will loan at 80% 80 uh, 80 loan to value ratio. And they look at that on kind of your whole portfolio. So if you have... I guess a real simple way to use our example. This current property on a commercial loan, they'll loan to 80% loan to value. So with 20% down, this is what the bank would loan. But say five years, six years down the road, or you've made some extra payments on it, your mortgage is down to $50,000.
and we'll just for easy math, we'll say the property value stayed at 100,000. So you would have $50,000 of equity, but because you still have that mortgage, 20, well, actually you didn't. So in this case, you would, um, let me make sure I'm getting my math right. Uh, let me look real quick. You would need to, they would still want to keep the $20,000 of loan to, to keep that original 80% loan to value ratio for the property. So you would have $30,000 that you could use that as equity. So that would, be, that would be allowed to be used as your 20% down on another property. So that, that $30,000 would allow you to purchase, uh, what would, nothing, with nothing out of your pocket, you could use that $30,000 of equity to, what would that be percentage-wise, people that are good at math? I don't know, whatever 30,000 is 20% of. So. So you could easily purchase your $100,000 property. So that'd be a $150,000 property. Yeah. So you could go purchase using just the equity, no money out of your pocket. You could use that $30,000 equity in this duplex to purchase a $150,000 duplex. One question on top of that. So then when you buy a property, you know, you're being and all that, you would have reassessed. So then you could use the... So how they... Hopefully the higher... Yeah. So the question basically is, how would this $50,000 be calculated? Um, they would, when you use uh, a property as collateral, you want to use the equity in it, you have to get that property reappraised by a licensed appraiser. So it is going to appraise that. Uh, the appraisers have been quite good lately. I mean, they give you a nice, fair market price is what we've seen overall. So they, it would do a good job of reflecting um, if you had done siding, that would be factored into what the appraiser would appraise it at. Um, if you had been able to increase rent and property values had gone up into the area, that would also factor in. So in reality, over five years, excuse me, this property would probably be worth, um, it wouldn't be unreasonable to assume if you made some, cleaned it up and had good rental history, that it would be worth 120000 in five years. So that would be another $20,000 of equity. So you would actually have $70,000 in equity, which would give you $50,000 of usable equity. So you could go purchase a, a $250,000 fourplex for using just the equity in your duplex. So, yeah, the banks, there's, Andy's going to talk about, Andy is going to come in next week, and he's going to talk about uh, the commercial banking side of things and uh, real estate investing. So we can even dive into more detail um, he knows that better than I do, obviously. But, I mean, it's, it's really neat. We've done a lot of our growth just through using the equity to purchase another property. So we, uh, we purchased a... We just purchased those two aplexes with no money down. So we just used equity. So the cash flow reflects that. I mean, it's, it's really nice. We purchased the property. It's at 100% loan right now. So there's no equity in it, but we did it with no money down. The cash flow is lower because of that, because you know this builds in a nice little bit. You're not paying a mortgage on, which is nice. So the cash flow is a little lower, but we still have two a nice property that we were able to purchase with zero down, just using the the equity from from other properties. So that's real estate investing has all kinds of. I mean, there's so many options. So um, on the loan-to-value idea, I, when we met with Peter's Rental, um, they're a Christian company, and um, so they different than a lot of rental advice you'll get. They actually they shoot for a 50% loan-to-value ratio on all their properties. So they want to have half of it paid off, and they try to stay about that. What they told us is if they're trying to grow and purchase more properties, they'll let that get up to maybe 60, 65 percent. And then they try to, you know, either slow down their purchasing and let the mortgages get paid down, to, or they'll make extra payments to try to get back to their ideal 50-50. So we, we've, our goal is to kind of use their model. I thought that was really wise coming from a Christian company. So you can stay at your 80 percent loan-to-value ratio indefinitely. I just, I don't, I like that idea of being a little more conservative with the amount of debt you're carrying. So 
we do monitor that and try to try to make wise decisions. So. Yeah, mom, we've mom, mom, it's a family run business right now, so mom, we've got a good team going. Mom handles all the people side of things and she likes it. She actually really there's always stuff you don't like, but she really enjoys it. You know, we one of our goals with owning properties is we try to price our rent like in the middle of the road. We don't want to be on the high side of what that apartment should be renting and obviously we don't want to be right on the low side. We try to just be at a nice fair price. Because our, our theory is that the people are going to know they're getting a fair price. And then we try to serve them well. If they need a repair done, we try to get there quickly. We try to treat them respectfully and communicate if, if we're busy and we can't get there. Um, and that just, it makes happier people. So we try, we value that relationship with the tenant more than, say, we could get another $50 a month. But we we like having them feel like they're getting a good deal and then that helps mom's relationship with them. It makes her job so much easier. When a tenant calls and they're happy because they feel like they're getting a fair deal and we're treating them well, we're taking care of things, then they're happy when they call instead of we're the, we're the landlord squeezing every penny out of them. So we had one tenant leave that um, he, stayed, he stayed there two years. We tried to keep the places nicely maintained. One of our other models is that Obviously, I don't want with four kids. I don't want to move out of my house into a two-bedroom apartment. But our motto is: if we needed, if we were in that situation, in that price range, looking for a property, that we would live in our rental. We don't want the condition to be so bad that we wouldn't live in it. That makes us very unhappy. So that's kind of one of our mottos: is that we would, if we were in that life situation, that that was the price range we were looking at, that we would live in that that property. And I think people know that too. I mean, they can, they can see it. So the one guy that moved out, he said that uh, we were the best landlords he ever had and we treated him like family. So we were the, yeah. <laughs> but I, I, that's the relationship we want to have with the tenants. I mean, you do have a, rela there's a relationship aspect with them. You, you know, there, we have some, the longest tenant we had lived in one of our places 17 years. So... And he lived in his place until he was 80, 81 or 82, and he, he had to go to an assisted living facility. And so he, we were really nice to him, so not, not much. He, he actually lived in, he lived in three different apartments. So he lived in that, if you remember that place we purchased down in, Cam, or in Prairie Farm. He lived, he lived there when we purchased the building. And he really liked us as landlords. So when we were selling, he said, I want to stay with you guys as landlords. So he moved up to one of our places in Cameron, um, which was on a second story. And as he was getting older, the stairs were getting harder. So he asked if when we have a ground floor place open up, if he could move to a ground floor. So 17 years, he was in three different places as his, you know, kind of his health needed. But So he was, he stayed a long time. So you do, you know, you want to, at least our opinion is you want to have a good relationship with them because you may be, they may be your tenants for 5, 10, 15 years. So we value that relationship with the tenants. So we'll, we try to keep our rent fair and try to keep the, the repairs done. So is it okay if we move on to how to analyze property value now? So um, there's a couple, we're going to look at uh, two areas and two, two methods that I like to use for analyzing property value. The one um, is probably the one I use, I put a little more weight on this one. Um, so the first way we're going to talk about analyzing property value is uh, an income multiplier approach. You guys in real estate probably are familiar with this one. So um, basically the, the income multiplier is, is really simple, which is why I like it. So the way you would take, we'll keep with our we're going to keep this example property for quite a while. So the way you would use an income multiplier approach to analyze a rental property is you would take your gross monthly rent. So in our case, that was $1,200 a month. And you get to pick the multiplier. The multiplier depends a little bit by um, what the real estate market is doing, uh, property condition. So you're, you kind of got a range that, that I've seen typical. Um, 
the range would be anywhere of a multiplier from 80. I'm going to explain this in a little bit, so I'm just going to write down the numbers. 80 to 95. Um, so we'll just plug in for years and years and years. Um, not so much today because the real estate market's so crazy and everything's, um, everything's expensive. But for a very, very long time, an, a multiplier of 85 was really normal to see. Um, so you take your gross monthly rent times 85. Oh, I did my math. I'm going to erase that. I did my math with a multiplier of 90. <laughs> so I'm not going to redo my math here. So you'd analyze it by, you take your monthly rent, you pick your multiplier based on, on factors, and then you end up, this would give us a value of $108,000. Which in our scenario, we had a purchase price of 100000 So you can see where that kind of lines up pretty good. Right now, things are high, so everything's leaning more towards this 95 multiplier right now. If, if you take your monthly rent and look at it, because the, and that reflects like a really strong real estate market that, that used to reflect like your really high-end, well-maintained, like perfect property would be getting in that 95 multiplier range. But now it's getting to be more the norm to see multipliers at 90, 95% for the, the price. So, um, do you real estate agents have anything you want to add about the, the rent multiplier? Anything I'm missing? I like it because of its simplicity. So it's just a real quick, I mean, you can do it on your phone in a couple minutes. You know, you could even be in the car on your way to look at a place and like, is this one worth it? And just punch that in. Um, and that one is actually used, a lot of banks will ask the commercial, a commercial appraiser um, to weight the appraisal more heavily on this income multiplier um, method. So we've actually run into trouble when you get into a duplex, um, it falls into residential appraisals. And the residential, res, residential appraisers don't understand this method as much. So the bank, we've actually had to go have some appraisals redone because they just did it like a regular house and just used comparables. And then the price was way off. So we've all, some residential uh, appraisers have actually had to be kind of retaught. Like, okay, you're, you're doing an income property now. You need to weight it on this method. And when they've done that, they've refined it. So. I, I might be a little bit lost here. So okay. Yes. Purchase. Yes. And so I'm going to ask you, how much are you getting for rent? Yes. Tell me 1200 Yep. And then I'm going to use that whole thing and go, oh, okay, that 100000 is doable. Yes, exactly. That's what, that doesn't help? Yes. Okay. So the question is, um, for those watching online or watching later, uh, the question is, you're going to look at a property, you hear the monthly rent, you plug in this multiplier, and then you can see that the asking price of $100,000 for that duplex is a, is a pretty good price based on this income multiplier approach. So that's exactly right. That, that would be precisely how you want to use it. So, and which is one of the main reasons I like it, because it's just really fast. You can hear the monthly rent. You can pull out your, your calculator on your phone, and you can see, okay, their purchase price is, is pretty fair. Or you can see, whoa, <laughs> their purchase price is like $20,000 too high for the rent. And at that point, you would need to analyze, is their rent accurate? You know, are they really low? We've run into a lot of people that have had their rentals a long time, and their rent is super low. So you can't necessarily use that current rent to, to guess the, or to use this for analyzing the value. So we purchased one place that the highest rent for a two-bedroom is in Rice Lake, was four hundred and sixty dollars a month. <laughs> that was the highest rent they were getting. Some people are paying three seventy five a month still. So we could not use their current rents to to figure out <laughs> the value. So but this is this is a really nice I like the simplicity and how quick it is. As long as you feel like their rent is at a nice fair price, this is a really good good one to use. And then the second method any more questions about income multiplier before I move on, I guess? Good. So the second method is uh, comparables. Mom does a better job of this than I do, but um, we try to watch the real estate market a lot. Just look on the MLS of rental properties. 
just so we can maintain a good handle on what property value is. Because um, comparables, like where they're getting listed at, if you can kind of, a good agent helps you a lot in this, track where properties are selling at, you know, because they don't, right now they can be selling at list price and over. Historically, they were selling under list price. You know, this has been a crazy couple of years for <laughs> where properties are selling at. But, you know, the list price isn't necessarily the sale price. So a good agent can help you see, okay, this one was listed at that. It was listed at 100000 It sold for 110 because it turned into a bidding war and everybody wanted it. So you can, you can keeping an eye on, your, on comparables is also an excellent way to, to know your property values if you're looking to purchase. Um, and picking a good agent is a big part of that. So we have two good agents here. So... Um, and what do, how do I define a good agent? I'm going to, I'm going to pick on our agents here. So, cause what, one thing you'll learn, um, if you do go into real estate investing, a lot of it is about developing relationships. You're going to have relationships with your tenants. You're going to have relationships with, uh, repair, repairmen, contractors, uh, plumbers, electricians over the years as you need things, you need to be developing, you're gonna have, you're gonna need an insurance agent that can give you good advice. I mean, you're gonna be doing a lot of developing relationships um, through this process. So the relationship is when, a, when I think about, a real, as we've picked real estate agents to work with, um, the relationship is one of the key things I look for. Um, it should be someone that you can talk to easily. So communication is really important, communication and connection. Because if you're always talking to your agent and they're talking over your head and you're just missing them, you leave looking at a duplex like confused, what were they saying? You know, you can, I would certainly go back and talk to them first, but if that's a regular occurrence and they're just talking over your head, you're not getting anything out of it, then it, it, that's probably not the right agent for you. I'm not saying they're a bad agent, but you know, we all have different communication styles. We're all different people. So finding an agent that you feel comfortable with, can communicate easily with, that when you ask a question, you, you're able to understand the answer. Those are all some real big factors I look at when, um, we've actually only used three agents, three agents over the 20 years that we've been purchasing properties. The first one was uh, Mitzi Golden, so uh, Ray's, Ray's wife. So we used Mitzi for, until she retired. So Mitzi was just a great relationship with her. Hello, everybody. So, then we used a good friend of mine, and we used him until he quit doing real estate, and then, uh, then we used, switched to the agent we've been with for like the last seven years. So, but the relationship was key in all those. I mean, they were all people that we just, it was easy to go to showings with them. They were nice to talk to. If we asked questions and they didn't know the answer, they'd just tell us, and then they'd go find the answer. So... So property value, um, that's the, the two methods that I use to, um, to analyze property value if you're looking at a new purchase. The, the income multiplier method and the, um, and the comparables method. And real estate agents are really a great tool in that because they have, through their subscriptions to the MLS, they can pull up uh, previously sold uh, real estate in a way that I, I haven't figured out how to do without a license. So um, they can just print out a list of comparable properties and it's super, super helpful. So a good agent is really a, a great asset when you're looking at properties. So. Any questions before we move on to stocks? How are we doing time-wise? Oh boy, we probably should not move on to stocks tonight. <laughs> it's 8.30 already, so we will have to, I will work out how to fit all that in. Because I, I, do you guys want to hear about stocks at some point? Yes, okay, so I need to figure out how to work that out with, maybe I have Andy talk a little less about mortgages and his stuff, so we have some time for stocks next week. But I will work, I'll work that out on my end for how to fit that in. So, well, thank you for, uh, Thank you for paying attention. That's a lot of numbers and Absolutely. details and information. So, yeah. So for you guys personally, do you take care of garbage? That's important for your tenants? We, we like the tenants to pay their garbage as well. So, yeah. 
the less, our philosophy is the less bills we have to write out and pay on a monthly basis, the better. So there really are varying philosophies on that. So the places we just purchased, he, wanted, he paid all the utilities and all the garbage. Almost all of them, like 90%. He had a few people that lived there like 15 years and were good at paying their bills. So he hadn't changed them. But he just, he did not like that tenant that got behind and then dealing with that bill. So he just, he raised their rent to be able to cover the utilities. So there's, there's two very different, differing schools of thought on, on utility payment. We just don't like writing out bills. So that's, that's our motivation. So take it for what it is. <laughs> Do what's right for you if you decide to invest in real estate. But, um, yeah, well, I'll just close us in prayer, and then we'll be off. So, Father, we just thank you again. We, I thank you every week, but it really is a privilege to be able to gather freely uh, in, with, with fellow believers and talk about finances, talk about you. So we just really do thank you for that blessing, that privilege it is to have that freedom in this country. I pray that we will all uh, have a good week. I pray that this information will be beneficial and that you will give people wisdom as they sort through this and decide if this is a way that they would like to start investing. In Jesus' name, amen.